This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. It's a grey, overcast, moody start to our day, but it's got lots of promise because we've already found tracks for a female leopard as well as alarm calls down towards the dam camp. So hopefully between Trish and I, we'll be able to find this female leopard. I have a feeling that it's Clalamba, so we're going to definitely try and see if we can get her. So hopefully you're strapped in and ready for this, your very own live African safari. everybody and welcome to your sunrise safari on like I say what's a moody morning it looks like a bit of cloud is rolling in apparently it's gonna get colder again today um, and so it's kind of nice conditions for now but it looks like one of those days where it might get a bit ugly later um, with all the cloud anyways the reason why we're rushing is because I heard the alarm calls for Kudu and Nyala um, not far from where I am right now and so I'm trying to get into that area as quick as possible. They unfortunately alarm call for so short in comparison to other animals that you've got to be a little bit quicker about your approach to them than anything else. But anyway, my name is Tristan and on camera I've got Morgan this morning and it's nice to be back out and about. Um, Trish is going to take over on the dam cam this morning and um, so she'll be there and then we'll have Eric at Ingada with us. Um, as well as I think JP at Pride a little bit later. Um, now we're going to go off road a little bit because where this alarm call is, is to my right. It's in this drainage line here um, in front of Weatella Camp, which makes me think there's been so many alarm calls of late in this drainage line that I wonder, part of me thinks that Clalamba maybe has moved this cub to this drainage. It wouldn't be the first time we've had a leopard use this area for cubs. Karula used to use it regularly. Um, but there's just been so many alarm calls every single day in the same places as possible. Um, you know, this is far more in line with where I would expect her. There's a bush buck there. It was where I would expect her to kind of keep cubs given you know, the territories of other females. Um, so, um, I would imagine that this is where she would be. All right, because we are coming to you live, um, remember that it, we want you guys to ask questions and to be a part of the process. So you can do so using uh, the hashtag Wild Earth or at FC on the YouTube chat stream or in just the comment section. And kids, we always love to hear from you guys. Um, so remember, you can ask on kids questions at Wild Earth. TV. I'm just going slowly. There used to be such a nice path through here. <laughs> it's become so overgrown with all the rain that we've had. Um, <laughs> it doesn't quite look like it used to. Spotting a leopard in this is not going to be easy, I'm afraid. Also, the reason why I think that there could be, if it's not a Clalamba with her baby it's going to be a leopard on a kill um, because this leopard walked in here last night um, and so it shouldn't still be here this time of the day all right so while i kind of get down into the drainage in front here let's send you off to our weather to see what's going to be happening across south africa for the day everybody. I'm on dam cam duty this morning. It's me, Trishala. I've got nobody on camera with me. It's the dam cam. And it, as Tristan was saying, 
there's a possibility that there's a female leopard around. Now that's why I'm actually looking at this side of the dam cam quite a lot, or the dam quite a lot, because last night when we were going down to our rooms, we saw female leopard tracks over the tracks of my vehicle driving into the parking lot, and it was very fresh, and it walked straight down the path that Tristan and I would normally use to get down to the rooms. And so if she was to come out, she would come out on the northern side of the dam. So that's why we're taking a good look over at, whoop, not quite there, but on that side. So maybe we'll see something walk through and that would be amazing. We could help Tristan um, find this leopard. I can hear lots of birds in the morning, the dawn chorus. The sun is kind of peeking out behind the clouds every now and then. So some more light would definitely be helpful. Hi Kay, you'd like to know if Salamba would move her cub during the day or at night? She's likely to move her cub whenever she feels it is safe. And most of the time, that's actually during the day. Oh, there's, we've got some light. And she will continuously move her cub and the den spot because it's not safe for, for a cub to be in one spot all the time because then the smell of a predator and a cub accumulates in that one spot and by accumulating in that one spot it can attract other animals even things like pythons cubs can get eaten by pythons and they'd be able to detect that there's something there by smell especially if a cub has been in one spot for a long time now drainage is a great place to stash a cub because it's nice and dense, it's difficult to get into. And when an animal does get into the drainage, sniffing something that's a bit tasty, maybe, then also because foliage is so dense, the actual signal of the scent can get mixed up. So it's a good place to stash a cub. Well, apart from looking out for the big animals, the predators, trying to help Tristan with the leopard, I'd love to see some elephants come down and an array of birds. That would be great. But for now, we're going to sit tight here at the dam camp and we're going to send you over for Ingala to say good morning. Good morning everybody and welcome to and beyond in Gala. My name is Eric and behind the camera we have got Craig. This morning we have actually got some some quite exciting news. One of the rangers just heard a male lion calling and he heard him calling, managed to find him and then he went to go and look for the rest of the pride. And so what he's done is he's just dropped a branch which is right over here. Um, and so we're going to drive in to try and see if we can find him. And if we find him nice and, and soon, there's a good chance we might get him calling one more time as he's looking for his pride. So let's go. We are going to start going off-road from here and just start looking for, for any sign of, of the lion, I guess. So what often stands out is that big black mane as he's got his head up. Or maybe that white belly if he's lying underneath some shade. So I'm just going to concentrate on the on the off-roading tracks that rule set. Ah, okay, I can see him. Lucy, I hope you not only crossing fingers, but holding thumbs, lifting your feet off the ground. Any good luck charm. Here we go. Let me get into a nice position for you. 
Oh, he's looking good. Just look at how that dark mane stands out compared to the rest of his body when he's lying down in this grass. At the moment, he's got his head up. Looks like he's responding to some noises. So he could just be listening for a response or any sign of where the rest of the pride might be. So somewhere where he's looking is down towards the Timbavati riverbed. That's where the majority of the pride tracks are going. And Charles, this is the, the really cool thing about winter is that we get to find these animals early, early enough to watch them. And it's cool enough throughout the, the majority of the morning for them to potentially do something. And it's really nice to see that he's got his head up his eyes are closing, so he could just flop down and sleep here for the rest of the day. But we'll stick around and wait to see if he does decide to vocalize and call out one more time. Uh, at 20 to 7, in the middle of summer, it would already be so hot that the majority of these nocturnal predators will be sleeping in the bushes. It's nice to see him out in the open. And one thing that amazes me about this coalition is how it almost seems like they, they're getting healthier and stronger with age. There was a time where both of them were looking quite skinny and, and a bit old, but they've just started regaining strength and they're looking really, really good and in very good condition. So if we have a very close look at around his mouth, there's some, it almost looks like white foam. It's a bit of saliva. And that's an indication that he has been quite active throughout the night. Whilst we're there, just look at the, the side of his nose up onto the bridge, all pretty much black. And that's from old scars when he's been in fights with the pride of lions, maybe even with his brother. Last night, we think it was his brother that we saw, and he was feeding on a carcass by himself. But if the two of them were together, then they would have fought over that carcass, especially because it was so small and he might have got new scars on him. Well, what he's responding to now and looking over to in the distance is the call of Rutting and Parlor, which are going crazy in some clearings not too far away from us. Uh, Kevin, these lion's coats don't really adapt to change for winter. And I think the big reason being is that although it is relatively cold in the evenings into the night and the early mornings. In the middle of winter, by 12 o'clock in the morning, you could be getting temperatures close to 30 degrees. So although it might be a bit cold for them in the, in the mornings, it warms up very quickly. And so they won't need to adapt to grow thicker coats at all. And I think 
Now, a male lion with a big mane, he's quite well insulated anyway. Here we go. Ah, oh, he's giving himself a scratch. Maybe he'll move from here. Ah, oh, there we go. He's calling this in. He let out a very low grunt almost, and I thought that was the beginning of a call. See, he's got his head low down to the ground, so he might be wanting to try and pick up the scent of the rest of the pipe. Listen. I think he's going to call one more time. The scent marking. Watch that tail. I'm in two minds. I mean, I want to reposition so we get to watch him nicely. But if I start the vehicle and then he starts calling, then we're not going to hear it properly. Maybe what I'll do is, is now that he is moving, I'll try and follow him just so we don't lose him. But as soon as I hear that calling, even if I don't see him, I'm going to switch off just so we get to listen to him. Like I said, this could be the last time he calls today. So we would love to hear that beautiful lion call to start the morning. Okay. It's good. I can still see him. This is luckily quite a nice area to off-road in because it's so open. So we just have to make sure we dodge some of the trees in this area. But for the most part, he's walking and towards a really, really nice area for us to follow him. So he's straight up ahead of us now. favorite things to watch especially with a male lion when he's walking away from us is the shoulder blades and how they move up and down oh, he's all of a sudden on quite a mission okay he's popping out on the other side I think I'll let him move one more time and then as soon as we lose sight of him, I'll try and reposition again. Okay, I think it's time to move just so we don't miss him. There's some old dried up pans here that I'll have to try and drive around. Okay, I want to have to do a slightly bigger loop because there's pans here on the right. So he is walking through the tree line. The clearings where those impalas were rutting were on the left-hand side. So I'm hoping that he does do more of a loop. Okay, I've got him. He's straight in front of us. Let's go this way, rather. Looks like it's slightly more dense to the right. So I'm going to try and stick to the clearings where I don't have to drive over trees as much as I would there.
Okay, are we coming to you can just see how much more it's opening up right up ahead of us. So it will be awesome if he comes here. He's on our right now. Let me just position. Mm. I think that might have been too quick of a view. <laughs> Let me try a new position. The way that he's heading, I mean, I'm driving almost at the same pace as him. So ideally, I'd like to just loop in front of him quickly. So I'm hoping he comes more left and not more right into the dense area. Okay, let me just do one more loop here quickly. Just when you think it's opening up, you turn the corner and it just, there's more and more of these quarry bushes. So if I do have to get to the point where I off-road and have to go over these trees, he's walking straight in front of us. So let's just watch him first. He'll cross open in the open here. Do you dream of traveling to a far-flung wilderness location where life continues as normal? A place where you can escape to nature and breathe. If you become a Wild Earth Explorer, then this could soon become a reality. Subscribe today and stand a chance to win regular travel prizes. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. So in 1998, we had this idea to go and put a live web camera on a waterhole somewhere in the Sabi Sands next to the Kruger National Park. And I approached just about every single landowner and everybody thought I was completely crazy until I met Yuri and Pippa Moorman. We thought it was definitely a fun idea and a worthwhile thing to experiment. And it immediately became a runaway success. And it gave people all around the world the opportunity to watch a little piece of Africa, day and night. Back in 1998, it was the very early stages of the internet. And all we were able to do was to get a 30 second refreshing JPEG out of that camera. But over time, what we began to do is focus more and more on trying to develop this concept of giving people the opportunity to go on safari. Even though we live just 500 meters up this hill, we still put the camera on to see what's happening. Absolutely, we watch it <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> I got into wildlife filmmaking because of a passion for nature and a notion that I could make a difference. Helping others fall in love with nature brings meaning to what I do. It's also a lot of fun. A couple of times per week, we receive some very heartfelt messages from viewers telling us about how Wild Earth has made a difference in their life, whether it's helped them through a difficult period or simply helped them to reconnect with nature. I think that's why we do what we do. Guys, just watch what's happening. See, watch the elephant, watch the lions. See, the first ones to run are the cubs. Okay, you see that? They are right here. I'm not sure how scared you were, but I was quite nervous. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth Daily. Good morning and welcome to Wild Earth. We are live at Eco Training Prylands at the moment uh, and we are just about to start our bushwalk. Our plan for this morning is to start from Impala Plains and then progress towards Leopard Dam. In the meanwhile, we've just been enjoying a beautiful sunrise. My name is JP LaRue and behind the camera we have got Glenn. So for this morning, we will continue from here and see if we can find anything in the drainage lines moving towards the dams. We're just going to pre-position, just show you that sunrise that's coming up there, creating a beautiful silhouette. Unlike normal 
we can also notice that there's a beautiful front coming through with the clouds forming a backdrop. At this time of the year, the skies are normally quite clear with very little cloud cover. However, if we do see clouds or fronts coming through at this time, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to rain, as rain is very unlikely at this time of the year for us. We've also noticed that the conditions have become quite considerably drier over the last few weeks and the grass is becoming more and more yellow and the smaller pans also disappearing as if they were drying up. Some of the other things that we've also noticed is that the insect life has started to disappear from the area as it is getting cooler and cooler. So we also have noticed that most of our breeding migrant birds have also disappeared and started migrating back to Europe and to central areas south or, or north of the Sahara where they normally will overwinter. There is still a number of residents that however remains in the area. We often find that with this time of year, with the temperatures becoming cooler, that days become more crisp in the mornings and then we will also have incredibly long warm afternoons and then a sudden decline in temperature again in the afternoon. Just, just, just called. We managed to hear him roaring as he was walking away from us. And he is still moving. So the very exciting thing is Rule has managed to find another few members of the Pride. And he's heading straight towards them. And so we're going to try and, and stick with them for as long as we can. And hopefully we get to see them joining up with one another. So I have kept my radio on. And if Rule does get hold of me, I might just have to respond to him just so we can figure out where each other are. But he seems to be walking straight in the right direction where the rest of the pride are. So this will be really cool and yesterday, when was it, I think it was two mornings ago, we managed to find the whole pride together again and these males weren't very tolerant of the, the sub-adult group and that's what group that Rule has. So if they do see each other we might be able to see quite an intense interaction between the males and the sub-adults. Okay, I'm going to just switch off here. He's just about to pop through the bushes and at the look, as he comes, look at the different behavior that he has. So all of a sudden he's got his head quite low down to the ground. So he must be smelling. There, like that. So he's on the, he must be on the scent of at least one lion. So as he called and roared out about 50 meters away from him where I heard of Impala who had no idea that he was there until he started roaring. I'm just going to move forward to get that bush out the way. We've got a nice view of him for now as he stopped and I think he's just taking in information. So listening out, maybe just trying to scan the clearings before he comes out into the open. It looks like he's moving quite slowly, but I think he's walking quite quickly. So, Mike, these male lions separate from the pride quite a lot, actually. And I think one of the, the biggest reasons is to, to mark his territory. Ah, he's now just laying down. <laughs> yeah, I'll try and get into a nice position here. So Mike, he, he marks his territory and he does these big patrols when he's by himself, sometimes even with his brother. And then when he wants to... You okay there, Craig? 
when he wants to, he'll just call out and follow them and find his way back towards the rest of the pride. He's in a bit of long grass at the moment. But this is what he was doing when we found him. So I'm hoping that he'll get up and move again. So he's now just grooming. He's facing in exactly the right direction that we want to be. Just listening, he's in some shade. So he might be slowing down his day and he might not move around too much from here. What would be really nice is if he just gives us one more roar. As soon as he picks up signs of the rest of the pride, he'll get up and I think he'll walk straight towards them again. Bella, typically when they're on a territorial patrol, they, they won't hunt. And you know, one of the reasons being is that they are vocalizing and they're roaring. And so they just basically, every animal within the area knows that there's a lion around. And so it's not very good for his hunting techniques because he needs to surprise his prey. But in between roars and when he's walking around, he might move from one area to another. And if, a, if an opportunity presents itself and it's a nice, easy meal, he's not going to take, take up the opportunity. So he'll, he'll go for it, but he's not going to put a lot of energy and effort into it. He might just chase and see if he gets lucky. Otherwise, he might not even try hunt at all, especially if he's roaring a lot throughout the night. So with that herd of impala, you had no idea that the, the male was here. As soon as he started calling, these impalas were on high alert. They knew exactly where he was. And instead of those impalas turning and running away from him, they just turned and watched him. And they kept a safe distance. And they just made sure that he was moving past the area. And then as soon as they saw that, then he, they continued to relax and feed pretty much around him. So we have got this male lion who's put his head down. We're going to wait to see if he might get up and join the pride, but we'll head over to Pridelands and see what JP's got. Good morning and welcome back to Pridelands. We've just been enjoying a bachelor herd of impalas. These guys were testing one another's strengths and the more dominant rams actually started chasing off the younger individuals. We might still see a little bit of a glimpse of them as if they're disappearing. Some of the behaviors that we've also noticed is that some of them are horn thrashing, as that they are thrashing the bushes and others were marking by defecating deliberately into a midden. And these little guys will try and chase one another off out of this area so that the most dominant individual will eventually establish a territory. As we've learned in the last few days, these guys normally keep a territory for roughly some eight days to two weeks so that they will maintain their territory in the peak of the writing season. Some of the amazing adaptations that Impala has when it comes to fighting is that the skin surface area around the neck is incredibly thick to prevent that the horns will actually penetrate the skin and the neck area. We sometimes see that some of these fights become so violent that they can even break horns. We often would think of it that an individual with a broken horn is at a disadvantage. However, they will still fight. And quite often it's these guys that inflict serious injuries with a broken horn rather than the one with two horns. One of the things that we also often see is when we have two rams that are seriously fighting and the one starts losing the fight, is that they will try and gorge one another and then what we'll find is that they can often injure one another or seriously um, or even kill one another 
if that horn does stab inside of a body, and this leads to internal bleeding. Good morning, Gerald, and welcome to the show and to ask your question. What we do find is that we have bachelor herds, breeding herds, and then also the single individual males that have their territories. The males have split it off from the breeding herds, and they started very little groups. And from that groups, we'll see that there's individuals that will start uh, setting up um, breeding herds with the females where there's a single male forming a, a small little harem. Sometimes that harem might be up to as much as 50 individuals that we might see in a group. And uh, all depends on how um, good the quality of food is in that area and how effectively he can uh, defend that against other males and also other quality, other uh, aspects that will determine if there's water close by for them as well, it will determine how big the breeding herds are when she comes into that male's territory. We also often hear the males at this time of year, and you'll hear how they bellow and belch, chasing one another off, as well as herding females. Not a very attractive way of displaying, if we had to put it in human terms, if you have to approach a lady by belching and bellowing and trying to chase her into your area. But for impalas, that seems to do the trick. We're going to continue from here. We're going to start moving towards Leopard Dam and go and do the rest of our walk in that area. But in the meanwhile, we're going to hand you over to Tristan, who's currently looking for Leopard. Well, JP, hopefully you'll find lots of nice things on your walk. We haven't found anything yet. Um, Unfortunately, where this is, is so thick and dense, and obviously there's a lodge, so there's <laughs> only so much you can do. Um, there's squirrels alarm calling in the camp. I, I mean, I wonder if she's not under one of the decks there somewhere, or if there's a kill inside the camp. It's very, very possible. There's no guests in the camp and haven't been for the last two nights. Um, so it would be easy for her to hide away in there. Um, but like I said, I'm, I'm sure it's her because last night when we finished dinner, we came out and we found her there um, coming into the drainage line from our room side. And then, um, you know, she hasn't come out from what I can see and there's alarm calls again, which indicates to me that there's something keeping that leopard there, whether it be a cub or whether it be a kill is obviously to be determined. Um, and whether it's in the camp or outside the camp, is also a bit tricky but it's so so difficult in there at the moment it's so thick and you know there's lots of fallen over stumps you just can't really get to most of the spots that i think she would use you almost need to watch her as she goes there rather than try and spot her um often if a leopard has its little ones in a lodge they get right in under the decks and you never you don't even know they're there until after um until they come out or you see them going in. And it's so dark and dingy under there and their camouflage works so well that it can be very tricky to see. Now, there seems to be, I'm just trying to see, there's tracks. Uh, they're all tracks for lions that came through here. Must have been from yesterday evening. Well, sorry, not last night, the night before. All right, I'm just going to scratch around a little bit longer to see if we can get lucky and maybe we find something in the meantime, though. Let's send you across to Eric, who has been lucky already this morning and is still following his lines. Uh, we certainly are very lucky this morning and I'm hoping that we'll get even luckier. We are still following this male. Oh my goodness, he's walking onto a termite mount. <laughs> and straight up and over. <laughs> oh, so he's just turned and he's moving slightly further away from the pride now. So he is still heading in the, in the rough direction. But the pride of lions is now a bit further to the left of us. And unfortunately, if he does keep going through here, we're not going to be able to keep up with him. There is lots and lots of bushes that are in our way. 
and if he just keeps walking, we're never going to be able to follow him. So we might have to do a different tactic and, and I might loop around towards where Rule and Nick are with the rest of the pride. Yeah, you see, I think we might have already lost his visual. I'll keep driving along this game path for a little bit and then I might just try and loop around back towards where rule is with the rest of the pride. Uh, so Dylan, that's you asking how far a male lion's call can be heard from and in ideal conditions, so if it's very still and if it's nice and cold, a human is capable of hearing that lion call from as far as eight kilometers, close to five miles away from us. If it is a lion, I'm sure they can hear almost double. Uh, you see, guys, I think this is unfortunately getting too dense. And as I lost view of him, I wasn't sure where he was going. So he could have again changed direction. So we could be just driving around in circles. So I am actually going to pull the plug on following him and I'll try and see if we can loop around towards where the rest of the pride are. They're within the same area so they're all in between the roads and the river here. They were also moving around and they were hunting so they they missed an opportunity to hunt impala. The impalas were alarm calling and I think this male lion was heading straight towards those alarm calls to go and investigate. So especially when we off-road driving like this, we're quite selective with the, the little shrubs and trees that we drive over. So we select the most common ones that are around and more importantly, ones that have got a very flexible stem. So we drive straight over them. We don't put our tires on them. We just push them over with our bull bar. And then as we drive over them, they spring straight back up. We've got a few different protected tree species here that we avoid driving over because they are either very, very slow growing or they're quite rare. Maybe they're even a bit brittle. Okay, so whilst I try and navigate my way out of here towards the other sighting, let's send you across to Trishal at the dam camp. I know all about navigating in those types of situations and um, it's very easy to get it wrong and and knock into some stumps but that's all part of being being out here we've got some gorgeous sun that's filtering through look at that beautiful on the water of the dam lovely reflection Very nice. The hippos are not at home today. Perhaps they've moved. They can move between dams. Hi, Lily Pan. You'd like to know if there's any kind of grass that we have that is actually toxic. Off the top of my head, I can't think of one. There's, there are grasses that are different um, have different nutritional value but I can't think of one that is particularly toxic as opposed to not just uh, uh, as opposed to just being invaluable in terms of nutrients so when we talk about the value of grass or the nutrient value of the grass we're talking about things like whether it's a, it's palatable and and whether it is actually full of nutrients. So green leafy material, or the more of it, it uh, the more of that a grass has, the more it can photosynthesize, and so the more sugars it would produce, so it'd make it more nutrient rich. So things like um, buffalo grass, they can be quite nutrient 
rich, but then things like a carrot seed, quite nutrient poor. And that's because they have very few of those nice flat leaves that can actually repro uh, reproduce, can actually photosynthesize and produce sugars. And the more of that they produce, the better it is for the animals that are eating them. So there's lots of grasses that, that have a, a low value in that sense. Then tell red tops as well. If you can imagine, like I described, a grass that doesn't have lots of leafy green bits to photosynthesize with, those would be those of low nutritional value. But I can't think of one that is particularly toxic, like you asked. But all grasses have defenses, just like trees do. But the difference with a grass is that because of the way it grows, it grows from the bottom up, not from the apex out, like a tree does. The grass needs things to feed on it in order to make sure that the dead bits, so grass grows like your hair. Imagine like that, like that. So the ends of your hair die out quickly. Now, just like that, the edges of the grass, the grass, the bits that we see that are reaching up to the sky, those will die before the, the parts at the bottom. And that can collapse on the whole grass, on the whole plant, and suffocate it and kill it. So it needs animals to feed on it in order for it to survive. That's its strategy. But they still do have some defenses, like tiny little phytoliths or plant stones or plant rocks, true translation. These are tiny little bits of silica that are in the grass that if a herbivore eats, eats too much of it, it's going to damage its teeth. So grasses too have defenses, but I can't think of one that is particularly um, toxic in a way. Hi, Ingrid. That is an excellent question. You know, I love mushrooms. You'd like to know if mushrooms grow all year round or only in a particular season. They grow all year round, but in a particular season, you may see certain types of mushrooms. Interestingly, so the mushrooms are just the fruiting bodies, right? So imagine the mushroom is an apple on an apple tree. So that tree, the apple tree, is still a tree whole year round the apples are coming out at certain times right so here with a with a mushroom a mushroom is a fruiting body and underneath the ground is a whole network of the rest of the fungus fine little hair like structures white little hair like structures we call those hyphae and they're there permanently throughout the year and they survive permanently throughout the year but it's only when conditions are right even just for a brief period for example as you would have seen if there's a storm and there's a sudden burst of moisture then mushrooms will come out it doesn't matter what time of the year it is that will happen and that's because the fruiting bodies when once they're ready they stay there they lie there under the ground and they're waiting for this burst of moisture. So imagine it like a sponge, or you know those those novelty face cloth type things where you put some water on it and it suddenly expands into this, this usable small towel. It's like that, it's waiting for the moisture and then as soon as some moisture comes, even if you collect some spores and you, moist, and you water it, so you're giving it the moisture, um, even though it's artificial, it will start to sprout, sprout up these fruiting bodies of mushrooms. So there could be different types of mushrooms you'll find at different times of the year, but it, it doesn't just fruit at a particular time. Here, because our rains are in the summer, we get more mushrooms in the summer, but that's just because of the moisture content, not because of the season particularly. 
in um, in Australia during the bushfires in New South Wales, there was a forest that was obviously very badly hit by the bushfires, and firemen were actually recording a whole lot of fungus starting to sprout up after the bushfires. And one of these fungus, or one of these mushrooms was called um, a stone fungus. And it had actually been dormant under the ground for many, many years. And it needed a fire to sprout up again. And one of the first signs of life after the bushfires through the actual charcoal of everything else that had perished were these mushrooms that were starting to sprout up. And that just shows you the diversity that fungus has. And that some will need just a little bit of rain, a little bit of moisture, even if it's artificial. Some will, will sprout up after some lightning. Some will sprout up after years of being dormant because of fire. So they're very, very well adapted to all sorts of conditions and environments. I really, really do, do love mushrooms. They're such incredible creatures. I say creatures because they're not plants and they're not animals. And their cell wall shows that they have a bit of chitin in their cell wall. And the other thing that has chitin um, are insects. So they're likely closely related to So imagine that mushrooms are more closely related to insects than they are to, to plants. Pretty cool. Keep your mushroom questions coming uh, while we wait for some animals to come visit us at the dam. On the 27th of April, Wild Earth will be turning 14 years old, and we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for all of you. And to celebrate, we will be finishing the beautiful book that we started last year that looks at the history so far. But we do need you to be part of it. Please submit your most memorable sighting, or what Wild Earth means to you, or even just your name and a comment to be included inside the book. Head over to the website to add your name and reserve your copy. And a big thank you to all of you who have contributed to the book so far. I was quite surprised and excited to learn that I had won the Wild Earth Prize for March. My wife and I started watching Wild Earth during the lockdown just to allow us to get out of the day-to-day -day routine and enjoy some of the bush sightings. Our favourites, of course, are watching the birds uh, when they show them sometimes, and especially the leopards. That's always nice to see on the show. Um, she will definitely be going with me, and I'm sure we're going to enjoy all aspects of the prize, as we don't get out into the bush often enough. Thank you very much, Wild Earth. Hi, my name is Tristan Dix, and I am a guide here at Juma Private Game Reserve for Wild Earth. We love connecting you to the African bush, and we always look forward to all of your questions. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, you'll need to register on the website. Once registered, go to our live safari page and submit a question below the live feed. Catch up with me on Wild Earth. We have a baby pangolin, a baby pangolin. This is off the charts. I'm, uh, yes, I'm, this animal is about from your fingertips to your elbow. That's the total length of this animal. This is unreal. This is unreal. This is unreal. This is like now my fourth Christmas in a week. <laughs> we should do this more often. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature.
Look who we've just managed to find again. And so we are with the sub-adult group that I was talking about. And just look at how the two of them have got the ears pointed in exactly the same direction. This white female now is, is closing eyes, but the one on the right-hand side, that young male, is, is watching in this direction quite carefully. And the reason being is that we've just heard that other male lion calling, and they're looking in the direction that he's coming from. So directly behind us, there were some baboons that were alarm calling, and 30 seconds after that, this male started calling, and he didn't sound like he was too far away from us. And... I think that one on the right hand side being a young male is going to be watching quite more closely because he's the one that's under, under threat to getting pushed away and bullied by the big male, uh, his father. So these two are, are nice close together and then there's another five that are just off to the left lying underneath some bushes. And these two are, are showing themselves the best. Uh, every now and again, we're looking over to the right. There's more baboons that I'm calling. Yeah, that sounds like we're going crazy. So I think this male lion is walking along the, the tree line of the river. And at this stage, after those alarm calls, those baboons are all just going to be at the very top of the trees. And we might be able to follow the alarm calls until we get a view of him. And I think for now, the best thing for us to do is to just sit in the same position and just wait it out instead of driving around looking for that male. Rather, let him come to us. And as soon as we was we'll know as soon as he's in the area because i think these lions will react first their eyesight is way better than ours and with this one male up and scanning around he's got a good chance of spotting the big male lion so so whilst we wait for this male lion to join us Let's send you across to JP at Pridelands. Good morning and welcome back to Pridelands. We are on bushwalk and currently enjoying a little bit of birding over here. There's not much else going on in terms of animals, but one of the birds that we have did notice fits right in front of us is a fork-tailed drongo. It's uniform black in color with a deep fork in the tail and a red eye. So it's one of my favorite birds as they've got a lot of attitude and quite often we see them chasing much bigger birds of prey. A while ago I was actually watching one sitting very close by to a Wahlberg's eagle, imitating the Wahlberg's eagle and then every now and then having a go at it. They're also very well known for actually mimicking meerkats in the Kalahari, where they'll wait for the meerkat to catch a food item, and once they've killed and caught that food item, they will then produce the alarm call of a meerkat. The meerkats will then scatter, and they'll come in and come and steal the prey. They also have learned that they can't do it too many times, because if you're going to cry wolf too often, your game is not going to work in your favor any longer. I'm just going to see what else we can call in. So quite often when I do call birds in, I rather prefer to imitate their calls or produce a call from a pull spotted outlet or the alarm call of a number of different birds to create a little bit of a birding party. Let's see what else is here. Some blue wax balls that has come in in quite large numbers. 
we've also got some non-breeding plumage weavers. Those are the dull yellow ones. And just below those weavers, we've got another little black and white bird that is coming up in the plunge, which is known as a southern black tit. Good morning, Sarah, and welcome to the show. There's a number of different birds that can mimic, and we find that drongos are very good of it. However, my favorite is a very dull brown little bird that's called a sabota lark, and it's claimed that they can mimic between 45 and 49 different calls, which has been recorded with one specific individual, and then uh, that they've as a general group of birds, uh, it's been recorded that they can mimic over 50 different calls. Now, an individual male that can mimic so many different calls can is normally the one that will be able to attract a far greater amount of females because the females will listen to the amount of mimics calls that they mimic if it's a single mimic call that they produce then they say okay that guy he's not so well experienced okay but the guy over there that can do 49 different calls he's very well experienced because it takes a lot of practice so i would like to have him as my mate we also find that in forest environments that white-starred robins are believed to mimic the call of African emerald cuckoo. And here it actually serves as totally as a different uh, purpose because the cuckoo actually parasitizes the white-starred robin. So it pro uh, produces the idea to a number of uh, cuckoos that the territory has already been taken. I'm just going to see what else is there and see if we can call up a few more birds. <laughs> quite a harsh call. It's normally an alarm call that's produced by shrikes. Many years ago, I had a number of dogs at home, spaniels, and I taught them to actually respond to that call. So when they heard the uh, alarm call of a shrike in the garden, they would investigate and go and bark. And uh, it worked very effectively because the birds normally started complaining at anything that goes on around the garden. I don't know if you can see that little black and uh, white bird that's hopping around that's called a southern black tit it's one of my other favorite little birds one of the behaviors that we find of them is that the young and the nest will actually mimic the behavior of snakes by moving the head sideways and then striking forward and at the same time hissing which is quite an interesting little behavior let's see what else we can call up <laughs> little blue wax ball that's just landed right close by to us over here on this branch. I don't know if you can see it. So for me, this is one of the stunning little birds that we have over here, a little seed eater. It's known as a blue wax ball, which has got a brown upper parts and that beautiful blue, soft blue, powdery blue under parts. And it's just flown off. One of the calls that work very effectively is this is the pull spotted outlet, which is active in the day and quite often um, in the early parts of the day and the late afternoon. And they specialize mostly in catching small mammals as well as birds. And that's why it's such an effective call to actually use to lure, lure out a number of birds. In the meanwhile, let's go and see what Eric has on offer. Since you left, we have two other individuals join us. So the one that's in, on the far end and then the one on the right hand side, that white male. So all three males within the sub group all came out together. We even got to hear them trying to practice roaring. They were, they were trying their best to roar as loud as they could. Not nearly as loud as their father, but loud enough for that male who was walking towards him to hear them quite clearly and we were almost expecting him to have arrived by now but he hasn't yet so we're still just going to sit and wait and just watch the behavior of of these sub-adults to see you know, if, if they might be able to steer us in the right direction see look there's one that's just picked up a head it's actually the the biggest female the adult of the group She's looking intently in one direction. There she is. And she was she went from sleeping to standing alert like that. 
And so she responded to a noise. And when we were following that male line to begin with this morning, and we heard those very soft calls, and now she's up. Okay, uh, Nick, Nick has just told me that what they might have been responding to is, was one of the other sub-adults within this group. But let's see what happens. I mean, as soon as this female gets up and moves, nine times out of ten, the rest of the group will follow. So it looks like they are wanting to follow the mother. And at this stage, moving slightly further away from where that male was calling from. And the mom has just stopped up ahead of us, looking still in that same direction. Nick, who had just left the sighting, saw that line right towards us. So she would have heard them when they were attempting to roar. And you know, if she was by herself, she would have wanted to run straight here. And so they're all watching that female disappear for now. Uh, wasn't going to be long until they got up and started following her. So it usually just takes one. Sure is. So the the dominant males within this area, the Ross males, control the pride that we're looking at. They're called the Birmingham pride. And then they also control the, the relatives of this pride. They're in a couple of years ago, they split off and one pride became the Birmingham Breakaway Pride. And so the Ross males moved between those two prides. And those are the only two prides that we know of. And both of them are pretty much only on Angala. The Breakaway Pride is quite a lot further west, so we don't see them very often. It's quite hard to find them. But then this pride is the pride that hangs around the central parts of the reserve. They're all running now. now. I think it's just excitement as they reunite with another individual. I'm going to stay here just in case they turn back into this area. So Tamsin, they don't really have a specific order that they get up in. But usually what happens is within a pride like this, you know, these sub-adults are still dependent on, on the older lionesses. And so what will usually happen is like we just saw now, the, the adult female will get up and move, and then the sub-adult group will follow them. If it's the other way around and the sub-adults want to move, but the females don't, she's just going to lie there. And it will only be a matter of time until the rest of the pride turn around and rejoin the oldest lioness. I mean, it, it doesn't really, you know, there's no set order. Nine times out of ten in a group, it will be the females that walk first, and then these males will be the last ones. See, there's contact calling behind us. Okay, so now they're both moving. Still no sign of that dominant male lion. But as soon as they move, I think I'll reposition and try and follow these two. <laughs> There's some squirrels alarm calling more left, but I think our best bet is, to, is going to be to follow these two. Okay. Let's see where they take us. So, whilst we try and reposition and get into a good view for you, we'll send you across to a waterhole. Good morning and welcome back to Pridelands. We're just busy enjoying a sighting of a giraffe bull that came down towards the dam. 
It seems if he wants to come and drink, but at the moment he is nervously looking around to see if there's any potential threats. They normally will do that before they approach, because I know when their heads are down to drink, they are in a very vulnerable position. <laughs> Let's see what he gets up to. But in the meanwhile, we're also just going to allow you to enjoy the beauty of the surroundings and listen to the bird calls in the background. I'm actually becoming very curious about what he's looking at because at the moment he saw us a few minutes ago and he did look at us and generally when they do look away from us it means that there might be a predator on the ground so what we might do is we might just reposition and take a short walk in a bit and see if we can go and investigate in that area and see what it is what has caught his attraction attention but now it seems if he's relaxing again now he's stopped scared staring and he's going on as normal If you love to watch Wild Earth, then we are inviting you to join our Explorers program. For a monthly subscription, you will have the opportunity to win fantastic Wild Earth expeditions, join our guides for a chat around the fire, receive weekly highlights from our shows and much more. All the money will go to keeping these live safaris on air, which in turn allows us to escape into nature every single day. The Mara Triangle is a jewel in the Kenyan conservation crown and thanks to the dedication of the Mara Conservancy, it thrives as one of Earth's greatest national treasures. We have been experiencing a reduction in the waste nets that uh, we collect on a monthly basis and this is basically attributed to our intense patrols. Over the years, this courageous team of anti-poachers has reduced poaching to almost zero. I'm United States, Stephen Polereso. As a result of the global pandemic and the massive reduction in tourist revenue, the Mara Triangle is facing a financial crisis. They need your help if they are to continue their ability to protect this magical land. I'm Nikki here at Ambion Ngala in South Africa. I love getting questions from viewers about all the small things within the environment and how it all is integrated with one another. If you want to ask me any questions, please simply register with the Wild Earth website, head across to the Live Safari page and then post your questions there. I'm looking forward to chatting to you on my next Wild Earth drive. Guys, have a look at what we've got. This is better than my birthday. Look at that. This is the first time that I ever see cubs this small. Th this is so special. This has officially just become my best sighting of all times. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. Well, 
Unfortunately, I've left the area where we had that alarm call and those tracks. Not because we didn't want to, but there's a very, very good reason for it. Um, as much as I'm desperate to see Tlalamba and, and even that Cub, there's certain aspects that you've got to take into account and you've got to be safe about it and also not stress her. And where that is, given the nature of the kind of environment there and the thickness, um, I looked around a little bit, went, walked, I couldn't find tracks and it just sounds like everything is inside the camp and I don't want to get to a point where we stress her out and she feels like she's cornered or something like that and is then aggressive. Um, so just didn't feel right walking around there and like I say sometimes you've just got to know you've got to pull back a little bit it's not always about what you want it's always about us pressurizing them um, if they have a space and, and especially a first-time mom yeah. didn't feel comfortable whether she's been alarm called that already and so hi guys i'm sure we'll get tristan back very soon i wish him all the best with his tracking he gets very absorbed in it so i hope he'll be successful just like i hope that this gray heron will be successful in its hunt clearly it is on the hunt. I love watching them because they are so, so deliberate, precise, patient. Let's just do that so we can watch as it moves along. So they will be looking for fish, which would be, I guess, the, the big prize, but basically a whole lot of aquatic animals. They'll even take some small rodents and birds if they happen to be in the right place at the right time. I hope that this one will be successful. It looks like it's the first hunter at the at the dam this morning. Whoa. It's quite ninja-y. Slow and steady and in sudden turns. to watch. They usually are found on their own. Sometimes you can find a few together, but usually they're solitary. And they're active both during the day and the night. And they can stand like this, or at least this one's moving a little bit, but they can stand motionless for a long time. Just kind of sussing everything out. Oh. Out of the dam we go. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Not that this heron would not get a get its catch, but rather that Tristan would. Well, they're not the spots we thought we would be finding, but they are spots. So we've got in Sele, and she's in an area that I haven't seen her before. You can see she's sniffing and fleming grimacing. Um, so she's trying to work out what other smells she's picking up in this area. We're right for her is very far south. Um, I haven't seen her here for a long time. When she first came in, she used to come down this side every now and then. 
Um, but this is the first time that I've seen her here in, in months. Um, and you can see she's intrigued with something, whether it's a male that she's picking up there or another female, I'm not sure. Um, but there's definitely a lot of smelling and Fleming grimacing and trying to work out exactly um, what is going on um, around her territory. This is an area where it's a bit of a bone of contention between three different females. So she comes down the side sometimes, like I say, um, but this is more Tandi Tlalamba around this area. But lately, there's also been a fair amount of males around here. So we know Tlangula has been down here. Um, there's been a new male that was seen recently um, that comes here. Tingana even every now and then roams around and Mulawati. So you've got four different males and three different females that can potentially be in in this just in this little section and so maybe she's picking up the scent of one of those individuals and is now just trying to work out who exactly um is who and what she's dealing with is it another female is it a you know a male um does she need to worry now sometimes if it's another female and she's a bit kind of irritated by it you see after the scenting like this that they saw um if it's a she's coming into estrus again and it's a um male leopard then she'll also soar to try and get the male's attention but it looks like she's going to go off the road um which is not ideal because where she's going is quite dense and quite thick or she could just be coming around us let's just wait and see what she does maria i think it's naive for us to think that leopards don't recognize scent um, or sound um, you know they are sophisticated animals that rely heavily on their senses in order to survive and so when a leopard has um, you know walked around and it's smelt other leopards and it uses that to stay alive i'm pretty sure that they're able to pick up scent and remember it's whether that be a car whether it be you know a person whether it be um, another leopard i'm pretty sure they're able to tell that there's slightly different scent to everybody whether they analyze that scent as much as they do for other leopards i probably not you don't see a leopard walking on a human track and then Fleming grimacing um, well i certainly have never seen it um, but you know with with other leopards they obviously that's the data that they really want they're not that interested um in humans and what we have to offer all right let's try and see if we can keep up with her it's quite thick in here and it's not easy to follow a leopard in this area but we'll try our very very best Definitely on a mission, that's for sure. His nose is to the ground the whole time. All right, so I'm gonna try to keep up with her and see where she goes. In the meantime, though, let's send you back across to JP. Apparently he's got something to show all of us. Good morning and welcome back to Pridelands the moment we still at leopard dam and we discovered another leopard track over here and in the last few days i've actually noticed an increase of the tracks of this specific male leopard in the area and it seems if he's actually set it up a territory in this area because we noticed we spraying urine as well as we often been defecating over the last few days which is all means of actually demarcating a territory so if we look at the track over here, this is a back part of a pad, and we can just see the three lobes in the back, and then the very round toes. This is a front foot that we have over here. It's generally much larger and broader compared to the hind foot. But when, if we go into here, we'll actually notice a back foot. And it seems if we've got one, two, three lobes over here, and you can see that it's much narrower compared to that. And here we've got another front foot, but this front foot is going into this direction and the hind foot is going into this direction. So he's actually backtracked on his own path and walked back on this footpath. Maybe this is what our giraffe saw and upset at him for a few seconds. But we're gonna go and have a look. But giraffe in general isn't too much concerned about leopard because they know that a leopard is too small to go for them. However, there is records of young um, giraffes being taken by leopard and being dragged up into a tree. But that's normally a very large male that would have done that. 
The only real threat that giraffe really has in an area like this is generally lion. And lion needs to normally work in his team to bring down such a large animal that has a potential of weighing up to 1,400 kilograms, compared to the average lion that weighs in the vicinity of 170 to 200 kilograms, depending if it's male or female, which we take into account. We're going to continue and follow our track and go and see what the giraffe has been up to and what has been hindering him. While we follow up, we're going to hand you over to Eric, who is currently located on Lion. So we've just had the whole pride walking straight past our vehicle and they've just decided to move off of the road now. The, so what's basically happened is it looks like there was the, the, one of the, the sub-adult group, a, a young female, joined up with the pride and now the oldest lioness is moving them quite far away so it was really cool they were running down the road they were jumping on top of one another playing with one another and i'll try and reposition again i don't think we'll be able to get in front of them but at least we get to see them disappearing into the long bush and i wonder if this lioness decided to purposefully move in the opposite direction into where's well, where the um, the big male lion was coming from this moment it doesn't look like the, the especially the female or the male group doesn't want to move too far they're the first ones that are lying down but they are slowly but surely following the rest of the pride So that lioness there that got up and flicked the tail, she's the new addition to the pride this morning. And this lioness that's coming into frame, still on the left, got quite a droopy ear, so it must have got damaged when she was feeding in some way. going to move from one missioning cat to another one down in Juma. She is on a mission. She stopped briefly now. She's very, very, very intent on listening to things. She walks like 10 meters and then she stops and listens, walks 10 meters, stops and listens. So I don't know if there's maybe a prey animal coming up that she's hearing. Maybe she's hearing impalas or something like that. But she's definitely very, very aware of her environment. So it's been interesting kind of following her. And what's amazing is that she got to a certain point, smelt like that, and her whole dire direction just changed. She immediately cut northwards um, away from that scent, probably. I, like I said, I suspect maybe that it's a female. I'll try and stop here because it's quite pretty actually seeing. Um, seeing a, a leopard kind of moving along through the open grass and we don't often see them in such an open sort of clearing um, a lot of the time they're in a lot thicker stuff than that let's see if she stops again often then they walk a little bit they get to a point and then they stop and listen there you go figuring out her environment and wondering whether there's anything. And this is a good approach when you're moving through these areas because places like this will have a lot of dike, uh, steenbok, those kinds of things in them. 
and it will pay for her to just walk slowly and listen, walk slowly and listen. Eventually she can pick up potential prey animals. Also, if there's another leopard in the area, um, you know, she doesn't want to just be rushing around because she can bump into it and get caught out. There's a lot of lions around at the moment as well. Um, so she needs to be careful in long grass like this, not to kind of attract too much attention to herself too quickly. So it's a very, very common practice to watch leopards do what she's doing right now, which is this kind of slow walk, stop, walk, stop. So Lisa, it's an interesting question because I haven't been able to find a definitive answer yet. Um, because a lot of it is to do with conditions. Um, you know, St. Mark, if it rains, is washed away pretty quickly. Um, depends on, you know, the amount that's St. Mark, the vegetation that is St. Mark. Um, so, yeah, I haven't been able to find what is kind of definitive in terms of time frame. Um, but I would imagine that it would be a good, good couple weeks um, that it would last. Obviously, and that's in dry season, in optimal conditions. Um, in the wet season, you know, if it rains, then it's gone immediately, basically, or diluted heavily. So, you know, I, I think it just really is dependent, and that's maybe why I can't find any sort of info on it in terms of exactly how long it lasts for. I'm sure somebody's done a control test on, on cats and things like that as to, you know, how long a scent does last, but I certainly found anything on leopard specific in terms of scent lasting. Hello girl. She's so pretty. I like Inseli. I know she's got the one eye and sometimes looks a bit horrible, but I think she's a pretty, pretty cat. I, she's... What have you seen now, girl? She's just stopped again and listening. I wonder if she's not picked up some sort of prey animal. Kind of looking in the grass. This was a good place for scrub hairs. Uh, these are where they kind of come and lie up during the day. Um, in these kind of little thick grassy sections. The way she's looking is almost straight into the grass. Um, so maybe she's heard something scurrying about in here. Oh, she's wiping her eye now. It's one thing with Inselia that you'll see quite a lot is that she often paws at her right eye. Um, it irritates her um, quite a bit and so she, when it's secreting fluid or it's just kind of things stick to that fluid around her eye, she's often wiping at it just to try and kind of keep it clean. What's wrong, girl? I don't see anything. But then again, you know, our eyesight and our hearing is so s terrible in comparison to these guys that we definitely, definitely are way behind in terms of figuring out what's around. But the way that she's looking to me is kind of into the grass, not over the grass. Often if they're hunting something and it's far away, they have a different angle to their head. Their head just lifts slightly and they kind of look over their nose. Whereas now, she's kind of looking straight down towards the sort of bases of the trees. Um, and maybe that's her technique is that she knows things like dikers like to sit uh, under trees and get a bit of shade. So those are good places to always check. Especially if she can see a little plat patch where the grass is flattened, you'll often see a leopard go there and then sniff around, and from there they zigzag. And that's because often with um, Steinbock and, and Dacre, they are territorial. And so if they can pick up the scent, they know that that animal can be fairly close by, um, and they can potentially track them down with their scent from there. She's definitely listening, though. pretty with a little shard of light that's just come through briefly. It's not going to last long. Crypto Freak, you say it's great to see in Sele again. It's always a treat seeing her. I mean, she's, like I said, not our most commonly seen leopard, although we've had her a lot of late, um, which has been really nice. I think she's spotted something because she's just changed her whole direction. All right, let's try and just keep up with her. Hopefully, We'll be able to spot whatever it she spots um, pretty quickly so that we don't interrupt her whole thing. 
I must admit, the more I've followed leopards um, of late, I'm quite to kind of be very careful of you to interrupt them too much. Um get on quickly. Alright, so I'm gonna try and keep up with her and see where she goes. Good morning and welcome back to Pridelands. We were still following up on our leopard and actually noticed that it went into totally the opposite direction as that we, we thought that the giraffe had saw something. But as that we are walking, we found a large number of elephant tracks, which indicates that there's a breeding herd that has come through this area. But we also found the track of an incredibly large elephant, which would suggest that it's a bull that moved through here. Here, if we look onto the ground, there's some further field signs. This is elephant dung that has been deposited over here by one of these elephants. And when we felt the temperature inside it, it's already been cool. If it was still fresh, it would have been nice and hot. And we know that these guys have been left, or has already left the area a while ago. But we've, we've also noticed quite close by to the elephant bull, this track was actually a large amount of urine. And here we can see this little urine trail that's starting. And it actually goes for several meters further down the road. And this is generally a good indication that we have an uh, elephant bull that might be in must. Because when they are in must, they often will dribble and create these long trails of urine. It's said that they can actually um, dribble up to 400 liters of urine in a single day when they're in full must. So for those of you who are not familiar with the term must, it's a word that comes from um, Indian language, from Udik, and it actually means irritable. And this is when we find that the elephant bull has an increase of testosterone up to six times the normal level, and they're actually looking for females. Their whole function at that time is to reproduce. And this condition might actually last for a few days, up to several months. And what I also find quite fascinating about must is that you can actually switch it on and off. So if you're a young elephant bull and you're walking in this area and you actually detect that there's a much more dominant bull in the area, which is in full must, and you know that he's bigger than you, you're going to switch off that must as quickly as possible and get out there because the chances that he's going to try and kill you is very good. And what we also find quite interesting is that younger bulls that are in must compared to bulls that are not in must actually has an advantage in terms of strength just due to that surge of testosterone that's inside their bodies. We're going to continue and we're going to see where he comes from and what else we can find in the area. <clears throat> Here we can still see the whole drag mark of the urine as a dribble mark as he walked. So in the meanwhile, we're going to hand you back to Tristan uh, and the leopard that they just located. I'm sure JP will find something of interest. It's the nice thing about bushwalks, and even at this time of the year, you've got a lot to look for and talk about. Anyway, still with Incela, you can see she's very upright and very focused. So whatever it is, is she spotted something that she's keen on hunting. Um, this is typical hunting posture from a leopard. Um, so we're just sitting tight now, and I'll give her quite a lot more room than we have. Um, it might mean that we lose her, as I was saying, you know, in the years that I've been following them of late, I started to get a lot more kind of sympathetic to the fact that we make a lot of noise. Um, you know, when you off like this and you hear them walking and then you start the car and you drive, you realize um, just how much noise we can create for a cat that's trying to be stealthy. And so when we follow them now and I know that she's hunting, like I say, we try to give her a lot more of a lead um, so that she's not right near the car. Yeah, that way, if anything does see the car itself, you know, they don't spot her. They're looking at us rather than her. Um, and we're a long way from her and we can then turn off if we see the prey animal and just let her go about her business um, and let the prey animal also have an equal opportunity to evade the predator. But Lord, look how she's walking. You see how different it is to earlier. You see how those feet are being placed rather than just a casual flick forward of the foot. She's being very, very careful 
of where her feet are landing, particularly those front feet. And you can hear how quiet it is for her to slink through the grass, comparatively speaking to a car that kind of does its thing and drives. Does anybody around. else want to? She's watching. I don't know what she's seeing. I can't see anything yet uh, myself. I suspect that whatever animal she's after, it's fairly small. I don't think it's impalas. Um, I suspect that she's going after something like a diker. That would be my, my gut instinct. Although her whole walk is now changed again. She's back to just kind of walking along and not being as careful. Look at that camouflage that she's got. Isn't it cool? There's nothing better than watching a leopard slinking through the grass. I absolutely love it. <laughs> Cantrell's very cool when they look alert, isn't it? You can kind of see that the little hamster is turning the wheel quite heavily um, to try and kind of get them to where they want to go um, and what they're watching. But look at how she's zigzagging. You see this? She's obviously figuring out there's certain ways that she needs to approach in order to not be seen. And she's almost like a little ghost in the grass at the moment. I'm hesitant to move, but we can't see. You know what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go to the right here a little bit. I suspect whatever it is is behind this little thicket. There's a big tree up in front here. And I suspect that that's where whatever it is is. Um, Let's see, there she is. I can see her head. But I can't see what she's looking at. It's in that direction, that's for sure. She keeps looking and peering that way. I suspect that, like I said, there's a big marula ahead of her. Um, that's where it seems like whatever it is, is. Um, unfortunately, there's lots of bush willows between us and that marula so can't really see what's beyond it um, and that's another thing that absolutely fascinates me with these cats is how they're able to see that and we're not you see she's gone down now so she's lying down and this could be because she's now either figured out wait i can't get to where i need to be without being seen or she feels like whatever animal it is is slowly walking in her direction and so she doesn't need to move just yet she needs to just sit and wait and be patient um, and kind of figure out which way that animal is going to cut and then she can reposition again so it becomes a very much a chess game from now um, if there is a prey animal uh, it could also mean that the prey animal is just getting a little further away from her and she's just trying to reassess if she actually wants to pursue it or not Camouflage is amazing, though. <laughs> um, James, yes, I think so. I, mean, I think it's been long enough now. I mean, it's been almost a year that she's been in this area. I know she briefly went back once, um, not all the way to her normal territory, but she went quite far into um, Simambili. But and she's been here for long enough. She's mated now. She sent marks. Um, they've had her vocalizing. So she's displaying all the traits of a territorial animal. Um, so yes, I think she is territorial now. I think she's um, become a, a leopard that now calls this section home. Um, I don't think we're going to see her move again. Um, I'm really, really hoping though that she has cubs. Um, Another set from her with the set from Klalamba and hopefully another set from Tandi would really serve us well because it would basically mean that we have a leopard and cubs on three of the properties that we traverse, um, which is, you know, Juma, Bufflesook and Tortured. And that's always a good thing. Uh, and if leopards have cubs at a similar sort of time, it means that it also spreads everybody out. Um, so you don't get a lot of pressure on one individual um, with vehicles and going into that same leopard. Um, as soon as you've got like three cubs like that, everybody tends to go to the leopard that's closest to them. Um, and they enjoy spending time with that cub, you know. And so I'm hoping that she has little ones on Buffalo's hook. And, and like I say, in the same time, you know, we've got Lalamba now with her little one. And 
Fleet Tandy has another set. And then there's even the likes of Kara, uh, Shadulu. Um, we know that Kuchava is going to start mating soon and Sabui. So it's going to be lots of females with little ones around in the near future. But I really do hope Insele sets up somewhere close to where we are now. We get to see her with little ones. Because that'll be amazing. Nestled on the banks of one of the largest lakes in the Sabi Sands lies an award-winning game lodge called Chitwa Chitwa. Many of you would have been on safari here virtually with Wild Earth, but now we are offering you the chance to see it for yourself in person. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer before the end of April and you and a friend could win three nights to this luxury lodge. In addition to the unforgettable safaris, you can unwind on the deck, relax in the pool, and even savor the various bush dining experiences. Chitwa's holistic approach to hospitality, with specific emphasis on conservation, will leave you with the very best memories of the African wild. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. I was quite surprised and excited to learn that I had won the Wild Earth Prize for March. My wife and I started watching Wild Earth during the lockdown uh, just to allow us to get out of the day-to-day -day routine and enjoy some of the bush sightings. Our favourites, of course, are watching the birds uh, when they show them sometimes and especially the leopards. That's always nice to see on the show. Um, she will definitely be going with me and I'm sure we're going to enjoy all aspects of the prize as we don't get out into the bush often enough. Thank you very much, Wild Earth. My name is Ross and I'm a field guide at and beyond Pinda Private Game Reserve. I love getting questions from guests on Wild Earth because I love sharing and learning information about nature with new people and it also makes me feel like you're all joining me in real life. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, then you need to register on our website. Once registered, go to our live safari page and submit your question below our live feed. Look at this, the little one is up and about. Certainly hasn't had enough milk at this age. No amount of milk is enough. Oh, corky. <laughs> Too sweet. Oh, look at this. <laughs> that is stunning. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. So we decided to leave those lions. They were moving into an area that was quite tricky to follow. So we thought that you know, after such a special morning we had with them, we might as well just let them be, let them carry on walking for the morning. And we are heading across to a large water hole that's in this area. It hasn't been checked this morning. And it's always good just to swing past a nice big water hole, especially at this time of year. The one thing that we are really hoping that we'll get to find within the next few weeks is more and more signs of wild dogs coming into the property especially because it's that time of year where they're looking to den and Ngala has had quite an incredible record throughout the years of, of wild dogs denning I think in the last eight or so years they've denned on on Ngala about six of those eight and so we are desperately looking for them at this stage, hoping that they might be returning to us. Where we head towards now is an area where they, they tend to like because it's quite open so they can run quite nicely and it tends to be quite far away from lion activity which is one of the, the biggest factors where wild dogs choose to den. And so if they move towards the river and they hear all of that line activity they're going to get put off and move away from the area so we're hoping somewhere in the western part of the reserve they might cross into the property and start looking for suitable termite mounds with big burrows to den inside Some double banded sand grass that I saw at the very last moment. That's oof. <laughs> okay, 
there as we dive bombing and trying to dodge these sand grasses. Let's send you across to a leopard. Hopefully they are nearby. I think the Pungwe pack is probably a long way away from where we are now because where they were yesterday morning when the collar downloaded, the Talamati Pride arrived very close to that area uh, last night and so I'm sure the dogs would have heard the commotion with them and left and, and kind of gone deep into the Manuleti so we'll just have to wait until they come back. Um, and Sele was stalking a squirrel of all things. Um, she's lost interest now. Um, the squirrel is in the tree and just kind of bounding about, but she's not going to be able to get anywhere near that, I'm afraid. Um, unless there's something else that I haven't seen, but the thing she was watching the most was a squirrel for now. Um, every now and then she like perks up again and kind of looks and stares. Tristan, come in, please. The squirrel's still in the tree, that's right. Uh, Morgan C. Sorry, I just need to use the radio just to get another vehicle towards where we are. Uh, Lee, go ahead. Sorry, Tristan, we've gone to that dip past the Nsinga sign. When you say two-track, um, yeah, I'm not too sure which two-track you're talking about. Yeah, just keep heading west. You'll see there's a prominent, it's almost like a road that's been cut. Um, just turn up that road. Okay, thanks. It's just all moving. Look at the tail. Isn't the tail amazing? You can see how... It's kind of twitching. I absolutely love their little white tails. Um, you know, we get to see them a lot because we're generally behind them when they're hunting. Um, most prey animals won't see the white tail at all unless they are being told that they're not being hunted. Um, but we see it a lot because, well, we, it's an expression for a leopard, and so they often twitch that little tail when they're thinking about things. All right, she's off again. I'm gonna try and keep up with her in the meantime though. Let's send you across to JP, who's got a huge mammal on bushwalk. Good morning and welcome back to bushwalk. We're still continuing following the track of our leopard and we almost bumped into the rear end of this elephant. We were standing behind the bush, just drinking. At the moment, he hasn't detected us in terms of smelling us because the wind is in our favor. However, it is possible that he is hearing us. We just want to see what he's getting up to. He's not sure what we are, but yeah, he's definitely hearing the voices. But, um, it actually smells like him, that's a must because I can actually pick up a very strong odor. So we're just going to move out of the area just to avoid that he potentially can make trouble. So we're just going to slowly back off and see what he gets up to because it now sounds that he's really focused on our sounds and we just want to be dead, dead quiet. We don't have very good eyesight, so he's most likely not seeing us at the moment. I hope so too. Always on bushwalk there's the risk that an elephant might become a bit disgruntled and too close to you. So I'm glad that they're being very safe. Here we've got this Egyptian goose. Very reliable creature. Will always be around. Or well, they're usually around. At least at the water holes. I was hoping that its partner would come and join it, because they're usually together. And actually, despite what people think, because often they're thought to be an invasive species because they're all over the place, and I've heard people say that before, but in fact they are native to Africa, especially south of the Sahara and around the Nile. But there are a few invasive populations 
in parts of Europe and the US as well as New Zealand. Chomping away on those grass seeds. I really like their their bowls. It looks very rubbery. And that's just perfect for picking seeds. Gorgeous. Ingrid, that is an excellent question. We'd like to know, how do invasive plants get across continents? They have to travel on something. And the creature that travels most are you and I. So a lot of the time, invasive species of any kind, really, they're as a result of humans either putting them there to control populations, like the cane toad in Australia, that was introduced to control, I can't remember what it was, but, um, and then it, it became this invasive species. So when it happens with plants, you know, you walk around in Europe with the same shoes that you come back to South Africa with, and then you've got some seeds on your shoes and then they start to spread. But the reason that invasive species are a problem is that the species is not native to this area. So this area, the ecology of this area, is quite set in the species that already exist there. So um, the availability of water, nutrients, all of that, it's as if the plants in the area have sorted out where and where everybody goes, which areas are best for certain plants, and usually other things don't encroach on that. But when you get another species come in, it's not as if there's something wrong with the species or they're, they're going to kill off other plants actively. The way they do it is by monopolizing resources. And that's because this area, the ecology of the area, is so set and used to the way that it, that it has been over the years that when a new species comes in and it has slightly different adaptations, slightly different preferences, it can now pull more water than the plants that were in the area can. And that's how it passively kills off native species when invasives come in. They monopolize resources because in that area as well, where the ecology or the, the plants in this area have gotten used to what pests and things are around, this new plant, they don't have any pests. They don't have anything that's going to damage them and they can just grow quite rapidly and take over. Anyway, let me send you over to Pridelands. They have their elephant again and I'm sure it's a little bit safer. Welcome back to Bushwalk. We're not going to talk a lot and we're going to really just be at a whisper. Our elephant has now slightly moved off and we've moved off a little bit further away from him just to give him a little bit more personal space. Doesn't seem if he was aware of us until the wind has started turning again. But let's see if he relaxes again. He was just busy having a dust bath. We were watching him while he was actually sucking up the dust in his trunk and throwing it all over his body. You can see where the dust has now formed on his forehead and onto his back where he has actually excreted it. Mm. What 
what we're watching for at the moment is to see if he's actually really eating or if he's pretending to eating. Quite often when they do become aware of something, although they're not 100% sure what it is because where we stand he can't see us, they possibly can start pretending to eat, but then they try and focus on you. So they're giving you this idea that they're busy eating, but actually they're trying to see what you are or determine what you are by means of smell or ear ring. quite hard to see at the moment but it does look like if he's actually putting little pieces of food into his mouth oh. it's amazing to watch how he uses that trunk and he just simply rips off the leaves strips it off and then he pushes it back into the mouth One of the other interesting behaviors I often find with them is where they actually will break off a whole branch from a thorn tree and then actually put their foot onto it and pull it out underneath the feet with a trunk so that they can flatten the thorns and then they will start eating on it. And meanwhile, we're gonna hand you over and see what the others have up on offer. Sarah's done us um, a good deed. She's gone up onto a beautiful termite mound and is just posing as nicely as you could ever ask for from a leopard. I love when leopards are up on mounds like this. Um, she likes a mound, actually. She's a, she's a mound cat. I often find her um, sitting on top. It's a great place for them to be, obviously, because they can see what's going on. It's not like she's been up there for long, though. It's already down. Business to attend to. Are you on a business run this morning? Hmm. She's so cool. I suppose it is a Tuesday morning and it is that time of the day to start working and making sure that you find the things that you need to find, do the scent marking that you need to do as a business cat. Um, and so she's off. Maybe she's spotted something else. There's quite a few nice termite mounds here and what you'll find when a leopard is on a hunting kind of mission is that they'll use any point of um, height. So be that a termite mound, any sort of raised log, they'll use anything like that just to go up and look and the next mound is exactly the direction she's heading. So sometimes when you're following leopards through a bush like this and you're wanting to you kind of track them, it's a very good thing to always try and look to the nearest mounds and then try and figure out from there where it's going. Um, I'm just trying to see which way she's cutting, if she's going to go north or south from here. Um, she's unfortunately just gone behind a little bush at the moment. Um, all right, I'm going to try and figure out which way she's going to go from there. She's just gone static for now. Um, she's just through that gap there. Um, in the meantime, though, let's send you across to Trish at the dam. I hope that just don't be able to catch up with her. Maybe she'll be lucky with a hunt. Well, here I'm still hoping that some elephants will come down myself. I was so happy yesterday when those elephants were at Twin Dams. I've been waiting for that for such a long time. Now, a lot of you were asking about if I figured anything else out about the cocoon that we were looking at yesterday, I got a message from a viewer who, who sent me the yellow and black uh, Dauber wasp information and some pictures of the cocoons. And then I had a good look at them. While they did look a little bit similar, um, I'm still convinced that it's a kind of moth and that's because of the opening bit of the cocoon the top of the cocoon had the shape that is usually associated with a moth's cocoon Although it was interesting to note that even the dober wasps, wasps um, the mud dobbers they 
they actually do have some silky strands in their in their cocoons. However, it was not to the extent that I had seen with the ones that I showed you in the Mawati, the mystery cocoon. Well, what I might do is I go back there when I'm back on drive and get one of the empty ones and see if we can cut it up and see what's. were going to make it would have come out already and it's just those those little grubs that have not made it. Maybe it is a moth. We'll just have to find out. I love little investigations like that out in the bush. Here we have a Birchall starling. Hi, Pauline. You'd like to know if algae ever affects the, cleans the cleanliness of, of the water for the animals to drink. It certainly does affect the quality of the water, but not the cleanliness. So algae is not dirty. Um, it's an important part of any water system, any aquatic system. Um, it at these two. It, it's very important. It also provides a food source for lots of the invertebrates that live in the water. But if there's too much algae, like an algae, algal bloom, it can cause the water to be um, anoxic. So too much oxygen has been used up by the algae or cyanobacteria, and there's too much carbon dioxide in the water. So the balance is important. But it doesn't make the water undrinkable when it's at its normal in normal amount in the water. The cyanobacteria in the water is very, very important um, for the whole ecosystem, and that's because they produce carbon dioxide. And in during the time when the earth was quite ancient, there was a very, very high amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. Much higher than it, well, higher than it is now. Not terribly, terribly higher, but enough for, for it to affect the different animals that we get on the planet. And it's the, it's the fact that, and remember that oxygen is quite a reactive molecule. And most of the creatures that were on earth, the first forms of life, did not use oxygen. Oxygen was a toxic gas. So when cyanobacteria started to produce carbon dioxide, it meant there was less oxygen in the earth, in the atmosphere, because they were starting to respirate and use the oxygen. And it allowed the, div the, the diversity that we've seen since then, since then to exist. So it is very, very important Goodbye, starlings. No, Ellie's coming down to have a drink for me, but JP has found some. Good morning and welcome back to Bushwalk. We just managed to move around our elephant and we went up onto a higher embankment so we can't detect us. When we also moved because the wind started swirling so that he couldn't smell us either. He's now relaxed and come down back to the river for another drink. Let's watch him for a bit and see what he gets up to.
quite a, often elephant bulls can be full of mischief as well. And one of the things that I've noticed and experienced a few years ago with an elephant bull was also sitting very close by to a waterhole. In that case, we were in a vehicle and we were some three or four meters away from an, an embankment when he decided to, or well, he actually decided to approach us and then went to go and drink. The next moment, he decided to suck up a whole bunch of, a few liters of water and try and spray it at us. I've also seen them in the past doing that towards other animals, such as impala. I personally believe that elephants do sometimes have a sense of humor. A few years ago, we stopped for a sundowner stop with our guests in the late afternoon, as uh, so the norm is with safaris. A few gin and tonics was packed out, and a few beers and a number of other drinks, and our table was absolutely beautiful. And the next moment, this elephant decided to come out of nowhere and straight towards us. We then got back into the vehicle and he gave us a little bit of a chase, so we gave him a lot of space. He then went to our table, smelled the different drinks and the snacks, started picking up the cooler box lid, flapping it up and down, and eventually left. Okay, then there was less of him again, and we moved closer to come and fetch our drink stop, and then suddenly he came out of nowhere again, straight back towards the table. And he repeated this behavior three or four times. Eventually we managed to outsmart him at some point, grab our cooler box and our tables, and then he came running after us. Mm. hand you back to Trishala. She's just, just found some water buck, something that I don't often see around here. However, I do find their tracks. Yes, these water buck are quite large antelopes and are not very far from water, not usually found very far from water. They're all going into the drainage now. It was a nice little family. Just beautiful. Look at this male trying to figure out where can I go down? Oh, made it. From the antelope, they're definitely on the larger side about 250 kgs for the males, a little bit lighter for the females. And their calves are quite heavy when they're born too. Definitely one of the antelope on the heavier side. I'm just checking now if they've come out on this end anywhere. really robust looking antelope um, and more often than not it's a lion that will that will take one of them down I remember then Kahuma is taking a what buck kill um, oh, it must have been quite long ago now actually well, they have a secretion that they send out of their skin that helps them to to waterproof their coats and apparently also deter predators and you read that quite often but i can say that i don't think that there's any predator that will not take a water bucket just because of a slightly foul smell and certainly the lions taking it is testament to that fact tino hi you'd like to know when the best time to go on the safari is depends on what you want to see in the sense that when it's really when it's in the summer and there's been a lot of rain the bush is really nice and lush and there's a lot of game around it's just that they're more difficult to see and in winter the bush can look quite dry and quite sad but it's a little bit more clear so it's not as dense which means that game viewing 
is uh, a little bit easy and spotting animals is easier too. Also in the winter time, the, the smaller pans that are around that are around the property would have dried up and the, the dams would be the source of water. So if you sit at a dam for a while, you're likely to see a whole lot of different types of animals come down because that's a central point. In times like this where we've had lots of rain, at least now parts, the little pans are starting to dry up, but when we've had lots and lots of rain, those full pans mean that, that we, we can't sit at the central area and expect animals to come down because they can drink anyway. So maybe, you know, actually spring would be a, a good time because we'll start to get a little bit of rain and the temperature will be, will be nice in the mid to late 20s. So it won't be cold, but you'll still have the availability of the dams and the sparseness of the bush to assist with game viewing. Here's a little one. Now when these little things are born, this thing, this one is not, it's not just uh, it's not just born, but when they are just born, they're about 13 kgs. That's pretty heavy. Anyway, uh, it seems that I'm not the only one with water bucks. Somebody else has some too. I didn't hear who it was though. Maybe it's a surprise. We have come to the water hole that I wanted to come and have a look at. And the first thing that we saw were these three massive waterbuck that were sizing each other up and two have just locked horns. So there's one directly behind the bush, there's one just to the right of the bush, and then there's another one that's coming in. And they clashed horns, they, they butted heads for a, a few seconds, and then it seems like the dispute has been settled. But this water hole at this time of year is always such a treat to come past because there's just such a, a diversity and and, and a, a huge amount of animals that come here throughout the day. So we've got those water buck, but if we look further down towards the water edge, there's a, another big group of water buck there. You can see most of them are females. It doesn't look like there are any males. So females with some youngsters. Then directly behind them is zebra with some more water buck. There's impala, wildebeest around here. I wouldn't be surprised if a warthog was somewhere in the grasslands. And always really good for bird life. I mean, it is a bit windy. You can see the water's quite choppy, so not the best conditions for birds to be around here in, but sometimes even hippos in here and maybe some crocs. I think one of the reasons why these animals are so happy to be here is because of this big open grassland between the water's edge and the dense bush on either side. So they can lie next to the water they can spot anything coming in from quite a distance, so they're not as vulnerable as, as other water holes within this area. And for this time of year, it looks like it's holding water very well. It's the most water I've seen in it at this time of year in the past three years. So hopefully it stays a similar amount of water. The water buck look like they're facing up to one another again. Or the one wires. When on safari, there is nothing better than an evening spent under the stars chatting around a fire with the sounds of the wild all around you. If you sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer, you can build your own memories by joining our guides for regular fireside chats.
Subscription payments can be made by PayPal, credit card, and now bank transfer. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. So in 1998, we had this idea to go and put a live web camera on a waterhole somewhere in the Sabi Sands next to the Kruger National Park. And I approached just about every single landowner and everybody thought I was completely crazy until I met Yuri and Pippa Moorman. We thought it was definitely a fun idea and a worthwhile thing to experiment. And it immediately became a runaway success. And it gave people all around the world the opportunity to watch a little piece of Africa, day and night. Back in 1998, it was the very early stages of the internet. And all we were able to do was to get a 30 second refreshing JPEG out of that camera. But over time, what we began to do is focus more and more on trying to develop this concept of giving people the opportunity to go on safari. Even though we live just 500 meters up this hill, we still put the camera on to see what's happening. Absolutely, we watch it <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> I love being a camo for Wild Earth. The animals coming right up close to you, especially like lions. Sometimes you get nervous, but you have to go with the flow. <laughs> My favorite animal to film is the elephant because of how big it is. But when it's really up close to you, it's one animal that you would say, I really respect you. Still holding another one there. It's holding from the hindquarters. I would really want the wheel to cross. Is it trying? The clock is holding the tail. It's holding tight. Oh no! Goodness me! Lucky, lucky wildebeest. You have another day to leave. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth Daily. Good morning and welcome back to Bushwalk. We're just admiring the damage that our elephant bull has created around the dam. He's pushed over a number of different trees and here we can see where he was using his tusk to actually chisel off the bark so that he could get to the inner bark of his tree. And that is precisely where all the nutrients is, as with the outer layer is that we see over here is actually dead and has no nutritional value. So what I did is I pulled off a few little pieces of the bark that he has left for bass behind. And I just would like to show you how we can actually make rope from this. So one of the strands I will normally take and I will roll it over my leg. And then I will create two or three more of these little segments until I've got what I want. So normally the end product is starting to look like this. And let me quickly show you what we do. So then I will splice several pieces and then I will start plaiting it. And this is pretty much the technique that we will use. And this will provide us an uh, incredibly strong piece of rope. Let me just show you how strong it is. And this can be even used for putting donkey carts. That's how strong the rope is. It can be made from the inner fibers. It's not the only tree that we use for making rope. Nopfulness can be used. The inner bark for marula I've used as well. And then this can also be used for making snares or binding together firewood, which would be carried back towards where the people would live. So next time that you're out here in the bush and you lost, there's one little extra survival skill for you. And meanwhile, we're going to continue our walk and go and see what we can go and find. And meanwhile, we're going to hand you back to Nangala and see what they have located. still at this waterhole, just marveling the amount of animals that we have here. We've even been treated to a pair of African fish eagles that have arrived. And they are calling from the very top of a tree over there. So it looks like it's a pair of them. And it's a pair that 
I've been hanging around this water hole since I've been here, so for at least the last three years, probably even much longer than that. And so they're up on the, the tree, I guess just looking over the water's edge, calling, marking their territory. It'll be really nice to see if they have a nest, and usually the nest behind the dam, also directly behind where we are. It's really nice to see them and nice to hear them calling. And the weather's changed a bit, or quite a lot actually, in, in the last little while. It's gone from being sunny and relatively still like a normal winter's day to being quite overcast and the wind is blowing quite strongly. And as a result, because the wind is so strong, it's going to hinder these animals when they're trying to listen out for any potential threats coming. And one of the safest things to do is to come out into a big open area like this. And just having more species condensed together, so having that zebra and wildebeest group is quite clever. So, Martin, that is a good question. As far as I know, they, do, they don't have a rutting season. But I've, I've gone completely blank. I'll have to just look up and, and make sure that I get back to you, Martin. By the looks of things, if we look at the group of females, there are quite a few youngsters. And within the youngster group, they all look very similar in age and so that could be a coincidence or it could indicate that the females came into estrus at the same time which would mean that there would be a rutting season so there's there's three of them all very close together you know, and if you look at that male he's got his head down sniffing the females Yeah, so I guess they could be, but I will have to double check. really getting in there so he's just testing the females uh, Caleb I mean all of these herbivores that we see together they're not going to actively protect one another the way that they they in a way help each other out is by alarm calling at a predator and so if one species alarm calls, the other species will recognize that and, and try and focus in on what the other species is alarm calling at. And in that way, they help each other out. But a water buck is not going to help a zebra defend a zebra against a pride of lions. Uh, if anything, you might find the females of the same species, if there's a youngster, might try and drive off the threat particularly in this instance with zebras the, the females will do their best to try and drive off the predator if they've caught one of the youngsters and the stallion especially might help too but you're not going to see different species helping one another out and within this group they've got different tactics so impalas being the smallest ones are probably the most vulnerable ones and so their first defense mechanism is just to run and the whole herd will scatter almost like every man for himself and they'll just run in different directions almost trying to create some sort of confusion the water buck will behave slightly differently if there is a predator in the area and it's looking threatening they might actually move into the water to try and prevent the the predators coming in and then the zebras 
being slightly bigger, they will almost stand down a predator to a certain extent and then as soon as a predator starts running at them they'll turn and run. The zebras have got a very big powerful back leg kick and so they, they can deliver quite a nasty blow to a predator if they, if they aim it right. Nice view of that big bull water buck coming down to drink. That was the call of the fish eagles. And so this is a, a really, really nice water hole to come to, especially in the winter time. And like I was saying, because it's it's also just one of the largest water bodies within the area, so we tend to see a lot of traffic. And the the longer into the morning you wait, it just tends to get better and better and better. just scanning into the tree line expecting to see maybe an elephant bull coming down after feeding through the morning it would be crazy cool to see a big herd of buffalo in this area it's a species that we haven't seen in a long time here on Angala we used to have quite a almost consistent view of nice big herds of buffaloes coming through but since we've had quite a few dry seasons and the buffaloes have split up we haven't seen the large numbers like we had four or five years ago so not too much more other than the animals we've already seen here. We're going to continue on with our game drive and we'll send you across to Trishala, who's at the dam camp. Well, I've found a pied kingfisher that's giving me a lot of grief trying to get to it and focus on it, and by the time I do, it's off again. I think I've lost it now. So while I've been here, I've been looking through my insect book and trying to figure out um, what it could be. And the more I look at the, the mud double wasp nests, the more I think that it might be that. But the way to confirm would be to go to to that spot again. Yay! And nay. And cut one open and see if there are any spiders inside. That would be best. I've never seen those mud constructed cocoons that hairy or as hairy as the ones that I saw yesterday. But that's just the purpose of what we're doing and why we do it because not everything it fits into a perfect category. Sometimes things are a little different. Sometimes animals and insects use what is best for them, what's the most available resource at the time. So some of the, the nests might look more silky and hairy at one point and more muddy at a different point. So we'll go find one, open it up and see see exactly what we've got there. That's the best way to learn as well. Hi Jenny, you'd like to know if birds also eat bones to get calcium? Well they don't have the luxury of being able to pick and choose what they swallow. 
but luckily for them they have a gizzard, an area in their stomachs or part of their stomach that where rocks and other hard things accumulate and help to crush things like bone. And yes, we would need bone or the birds would need bone in order to get a good amount of calcium. It looks like a Warburg's. Is it? Let's see. Oh, it's just a big grey go away bird. And it's gone. Um, so they certainly need to get some calcium and bones are a great source of calcium. But they can't digest bone. They can certainly break it with that gizzard and release some of the calcium, but they can't digest bone. That lovely talent is left to the hyenas. Well, water buck is still around. They look a little bit nervous. Oh, there's the Pied Kingfisher. Um, as the water buck should be in this weather, especially with youngsters. Little water buck like that, easily a leopard could take it. Very nice. Lisa, you'd like to know what different grasses on Juma and what animals feed on those grasses. So, if an animal is a, is a grazer, they might have preference for a certain grass, like a grass with high nutritional value. But uh, there's not really a specific grass that um, a species, a certain species will only eat because grazers, especially bulk grazers, will just kind of go along and eat whatever grass they can. Um, so buffalo grass has a really high nutri nutritional value and l most animals that eat grass would prefer buffalo grass. And there's also grasses like um, blue seed grass that is fairly average when it comes to nutrition. But things like guinea grass, they have a, quite a high grazing value, that's what we call that. Um, so does red grass. But all the other grasses are uh, pretty much low in terms of grazing value. So the other grasses that we would get on Juma, so I said guinea grass and red grass, they're, they're good grasses in terms of grazing value. But the other types of grass that we get are herringbone grass, gum grass. Um, those ones you'll find along seep lines. They're actually a good indicator of seep lines. Then you'll also get blue seed grass. I quite like blue seed grass. I think it's quite pretty. Um, then we get the Aragostus species or the love grasses. And oh, three on grass, giant three on grass, um, spear grass, and carrot seed grass and tell red tops. Carrot seeds, they're the ones that get stuck in in your socks as you walk along and you're doing bushwalk. Terrible things. Very uncomfortable when they get stuck in your uh, in your socks. Turpentine grass as well. You get that around. But the ones that I've mentioned last, those are not particularly uh, tasty or palatable to the animals, but grazers will still eat them. Animals like Egyptian geese, 
they like eating the seeds of grasses. So those with obvious nice big seeds, uh, seeds they'll go after those. But the grazers are after the, the grasses that have nice leafy growth it's because that's the ones that will be high in sugars from photosynthesis. Grasses that grow around the dam, which would be of many different species, but the ones that grow around the dam tend to have a higher salt content. And many animals will seek that out to supplement this, the salt in their diet. I like these guys right here. All right, well, Eric is out on a bumble. I hope that he'll find something very exciting for the last 20 minutes of drive. No pressure from Trishada's side. Uh, we left that waterhole. I think we, we watched the, a few interesting behaviors between every different animal and we are now basically bumbling back down towards the riverbed. No specific plan, but I mean, when we get to the river, there's always a chance of us finding things like a nice big herd of elephants, maybe some of the smaller or less common antelope species like kudu, a gray diker, something along those lines. So that is what our plan is. And it's not too far from us, so as the crow flies, it might be about two or three, oh, maybe a bit more, maybe close to six or seven hundred meters. We've got to zigzag our way there, so it will take us in the region of about ten minutes or so to get there. See, I think with all of this weather, it's been such an interesting morning to watch lions So Lawrence, not all animals have territories. So I just mentioned elephants for an example. They've got a home range, so they tend to wander throughout the area. And and they um, yeah, so they don't protect and defend a specific part of of the game reserve. And it's the same with, with many different other animals. The female cheetah, they've also got a home range that they move around in. And the wild dogs that are mentioned have also only got a home range and not an active territory. So there are quite a few different species that do not have territories. The ones that do have territories that stand out are the cats. The majority of them, so male, or lions, both male and female. Leopards, both male and female. And then cheetah, only males. And then the smaller cats will also have a territory. Um, hyenas, they've also got territories. So there's quite a few different species that have got territories and quite a few that don't. And I think it just depends on their lifestyles. You know, elephants, they need to move big distances where they can find different grazing or browsing areas as well as different water sources. So they wouldn't be able to actively defend such a large area. Whereas lions, you know, they don't need to move as much so they can protect a specific spot where they feel safe to give birth, to mate, to hunt within that certain area. Whilst we make our way down towards the river, I think Tristan is waiting to update you on his plans. Well, hopefully Eric will find maybe some spots on the river. That would be nice um, to see one of the Angala leopards. It's lots of beautiful cats that are in that area. Um, as for us, we've left in Sele. Um, she went kind of northeast into a very, very big, very 
difficult block. Um, and given that she was still hunting, we decided that it would be better just to let her go and let her do her thing. So all the other vehicles agreed and everyone just let her go. Um, we'll kind of try and see if we can follow up later and see if maybe she was successful. Then we bumped into two male lions. Um, they, it looks, I think it's the Plains Camp boys. I need to go back and just check quickly. It's not the Nkuhuma and Sticks male, um, but I think it's the two Plains Camp boys. One has got a very prominent chest mane. Um, and then comes over into like a little mohawk and the other one's got a much smaller mane. Um, but they walked all the way from <clears throat> some Mbili firebreak um, into Torchwood and they on the trail of a herd of buffalo there. Um, so I think, I think it's them, I'm not sure. I know that Inkuma and Stixmail have been on Ottawa a lot lately. Um, so, you know, it could be them too, but it just seemed like both boys had too much of a developed mane to be the Inkuma male. He's got quite a small mane still. I saw a photo of him about two weeks ago and his mane was still quite little. Um, whereas the, the Styx male seems to have a lot fluffier. So I'm not 100% sure. I got nice shots of both individuals and their spots on their whiskers. So I'll try and just go and compare them when I get home later. Um, unfortunately though, it was just in a very tricky area and on Torchwood, if we don't have a west facing slope, um, we aren't able to pick up our receivers. And so they just, 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 just over the precipice of the west facing slope and unfortunately just not where we can be able to broadcast from, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, but they, they, if they trail the buffalo, the good news is the buffalo tracks that I found, I didn't find them, but they're heading back towards Juma. So maybe these boys will follow them during the night. And uh, this is a question we get quite regularly with Nsele, obviously, and with Hukumuri in the past, um, is does one eye affect hunting? The answer to that is no. Um, I, I'm sure there initially is an effect that the animal has to go through a period of adaption um, in order to, to work out things with this uh, lack of sight on one side. Remember that one eye um, gone is, is a depth perception issue. It's not that you can't see. You know, you close one eye, you can still see perfectly, but it's just that you, your depth perception is slightly out um, and so there's a period of adjustment there but if you take within Sela I think she has lost her eyes now been gone for oh, I think almost six years now um, so if she was having any difficulty with hunting you know she would she would have been a lot skinnier and a lot unhealthier than what she is I mean you look at her this morning she's in beautiful condition uh, there's you know she's big she's round she's looking as healthy as one could ever ask for um, so no I think this is, the answer is that these leopards have such supreme senses of hearing smell the whiskers and the one eye that they're able to adapt and figure it out and find a way to be able to to find the food but they will be definitely a period of adaption um, so initially I think yes now after six years no I think she's completely gotten used to it and her hunting is just as efficient um, as anybody else's I mean we find her regularly on kills and it was the same with Hukumuri you know Hukumuri's eye also lost to a degree I mean he might have had a slight bit of vision but it would have been very little um, and yet he didn't really miss a beat he was also strong and healthy and then you look at a leopard like Safari who lost her eye and was also a very long period without an eye um, she also managed to raise cubs and all kinds of other things and you don't do that if as a female leopard if you don't have the ability to hunt um, so I think it's just this little adaption takes place and then once that's happened and they've worked it out then they pretty much are okay um, from there I suppose in a, a sense we can say that it does affect them a little bit um, given that um, you know, any loss of a sensory organ is going to have a slight effect, but they overcome it is probably the best way to actually put it. All right, talking about hunting, um, an animal that unfortunately out here has hunted more than anything else is currently with Trishala on the dam camp, so let's send you across to her. They are with me on the dam cam looking mighty nervous and they've got a good strategy. Hang out with the water buck. That way more eyes and ears means that you can be a little bit safer. It's two young male impalas. 
they've had a tough time these last few weeks being chased around by the bigger dominant males but now they've found a bit of solace in in forming bachelor herds of of young males that have no uh, no chance of competing with these older males all the antelope will be quite quite nervous with the wind so much wind at that even the dam cam is shaking about i'm just having a quick look around to see if there's something specifically causing them to be nervous apart from the wind of course There's another waterbuck, nice and close to us. Oh, look at this little one. Hi, Victor. You'd like to know how large are Impala male territories? Not very large at all, and they remember they're only territorial during the rutting season and only for a short amount of time, only about 10 days at a time. Um, usually it's slightly less, about eight days. And their territories are sometimes not even a, a couple hundred meters they can be very very small on quarantine we can have about four or five different rams with territories because where where the territories are concerned for impala rams during the rut they're not trying to include massive resources in their territory they're just they're just defending it against other males so that if any females move through their territory they can claim those females for their own and they can mate with them so their territories are very small during this time not not a kilometer squared or anything like that very very small just a hundred a hundred meters or less at how sweet this family is. So I've just come out from the drainage. The drainage is always a good place to seek shelter from the sun because it's nice and cool, there's lots of, lots of trees around, but also to seek shelter from the wind. When, <clears throat> excuse me, when we're on bushwalk, it's very windy and it's, it's not pleasant to be out on bushwalk when it's windy and it's also not very safe. Then we end up going into drainages to, to give ourselves a bit of relief from the wind. But it's important to know that many animals are thinking the same way. And that can include animals that are dangerous on a bushwalk, like buffaloes and elephants as well. Hi Adrian, that's a good question. You'd like to know if territorial hippos chase young male hippos out of the out of the pod? Yes, they do. They will tolerate other males in their pod, but only if they behave themselves. And what that means in hippo world is that they don't display any sort of aggression and they don't mate with the females because the hippo's social system is one that is a harem. So a harem means it's a single male with multiple females and her offspring. So they will tolerate a male coming in and chilling in their pod. But as long as... Hi, Tristan. As long as they don't interfere, they don't... Um, cause any sort of altercations and then don't display any aggression. Certainly don't mate with any of the females that belong to the beach master, which is the dominant male. And if they do, they will be violently pushed out and if they decide that they want to start a fight, it can be quite bloody.
On the 27th of April, Wild Earth will be turning 14 years old and we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for all of you. And to celebrate, we will be finishing the beautiful book that we started last year that looks at the history so far. But we do need you to be part of it. Please submit your most memorable sighting or what Wild Earth means to you or even just your name and a comment to be included inside the book. Head over to the website to add your name and reserve your copy. And a big thank you to all of you who have contributed to the book so far. For many years, Wild Earth has taken viewers from around the world to the Mara Triangle, a place of majestic beauty and abundant wildlife. But it wasn't always like this. Before 2001, it was infested with poachers. Illegal harvesting and hunting was rife. Now the situation couldn't be more different. The hard work and dedication of the Mara Conservancy has revolutionized this magical land. But now, the loss of revenue from tourism has created a grave crisis. The Mara Conservancy needs help if they are to continue protecting the reserve and supporting the local communities whose livelihood depend on its survival. My name is Taylor McCurdy and I work for Eco Training. I love hearing from all of the viewers. However, I particularly enjoy those of you who have been watching for a few years. Your questions are just so advanced and they really get me thinking. If you'd like to ask a question on Wild Earth, you need to register on our website. Once you've done that, head to the live safari page and submit your questions below the live feed. Well, there's a poor female that is being absolutely harassed by two males that are busy fighting over her. Um, she keeps getting clattered into and mounted without her approval, I think. And what we've just seen right now is one male lose to another male. He was busy mounting that female and he's been chased off by a different male now. And she's now stuck um, with a different guy. Now let's see if he mounts her. And the other one was trying to mount her non-stop. He's walking towards where she is. It's maybe you will, maybe you won't. Yes, boy, we see that you've won. It's just telling everybody that he's got himself a female. Um, <laughs> he's watching where the other male has gone now. Shame, boy, did you just get thrown out of your session? There we go, there we go. No, boy, you gotta do better than that, I'm afraid. That's a half-hearted attempt. And he's so worried about the other male, he's actually not focusing on the fact that he actually needs to um, mount her properly. You see, yeah, he's gonna come and chase this other male. He's in front of us. <laughs> These guys make me laugh. Yeah, the other one's running away now. This poor female, she's like, can we just get this done already so that I can go back to the herd and stop this nonsense? All right, well, these guys are busy trying to procreate. We, I just came to quarantine because I was just checking to see if there's any sign of this leopard coming out. So far, nothing. Um, Rexon checked in the camp. He couldn't find anything there. So she's somewhere around. we just got to kind of keep looking. And hopefully this afternoon, we'll get a bit of luck. Maybe there'll be some alarm calls or something that will give away her presence again. But even if she is in there, the chances of getting a car anywhere near her is pretty much zero. Um, in that particular section, so we'll just try and figure it out later. Um, like I say, I'm pretty sure it's Clalamba that's there. Uh, I'd be very surprised if it isn't her um, that's milling about in and around the camp. It's quite common for a leopard to use that as well as den sites, so exciting, but 
also got to just keep an eye out and make sure everybody is aware of it and careful around that area. But lots of promise for this afternoon. Um, hopefully we'll be able to, to pick her up as we go. I hope that you've enjoyed this morning. Um, hopefully you, there's a bit of something for all of you um, between JP on Bushwalk and Eric at Ngala and Ralph Trish on the dam cam and Juma giving up some spots, which is always a nice thing. Um, seems like there was a little bit of something for you all. But from all of us, it's been an absolute pleasure, and we'll see you all this afternoon on our uh, sunset safari.